The 11th Jeffrey and Joyce Myers Lecture Series. Um, as you can read on your program, but I want to thank them again. Uh, Jeff and Joyce Myers set this up with the idea of bringing optometry luminaries to Ohio State who are not from or affiliated with Ohio State. So those of you who graduated from here, this will never be about you. Um, but to, to, so that so the folks from Ohio State could actually hear that broader lifetime career perspective. Um, some of you who were here, the very first one of these 11 years ago was Dr. Irv Borish. And um, it's just become a tradition that is just one of the highlights of the season for me. So Jeff and Joyce, thank you so much for your foresight and your Um, tonight's lecturer, Myers lecturer, is Dr. Peter Bergetsky. He um, is an old friend of mine, not as old a friend as others in the audience, Tom and Roanne. And um, he currently resides in the Spokane, Washington area, but you live on Buckeye Drive. Is that right? Avenue, okay? So he thinks that may be his sole selection criteria for the year. However, it's not. He was nominated by Don Beauty. And his bio reads that he's P, um, let's see, wait, I don't have the right piece of paper. Um, he uh, was the director of clinical research and development at SEBA Vision and then director of professional and clinical support for Alcon Vision Care. Those were his most recent positions from which he retired. But before that, he retired from a position as associate professor and director of the contact lens services at Pacific University College of Optometry. And before that, he retired from private practice in Madison, Wisconsin, before he went on to Pacific. His undergraduate institution is the University of Wisconsin. His optometry institution is the University of California Berkeley School of Optometry, where he was the Gold Retina Scope Award winner. That's their top graduate there. He's a past chair of the section on cornea contact lenses and refractive technologies at the Academy and past president of the American Academy of Optometry Foundation. Um, so that, that Peter did an actor studio interview over across campus with Jeff today, which I think Jeff asked a few questions and then just sat back and watched the show. Um, Dr. Muti described Dr. Bergensky and his materials as a rock tour without equal with a wickedly sharp sense of humor. So I hope I'm not setting their expectations too high. But one of the stories we heard in response to a question about whether he had any interesting side gigs while he was an optometry student were that um, he and Tom and somebody else, I didn't get the other name, made and sold Farnsworth D15 sets in these beautiful cherry boxes and this is mine which was in don's office or something. i said can you bring your d15 down and then he brings mine too I said, i've been looking for that for three years and now i have it thanks to peter's visit so i would say um the things we've heard this afternoon and you'll hear this evening Peter is a renaissance man with a wide variety of interests and a truly terminal curiosity. So you are in for a treat. He's going to speak on optometry in three dimensions and the rise and fall of a contact lens modality. Join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Burdett. Thank you, Carla, and thank you all for being here. <laughs> Pretty impressed with a crowd like this at Terrence. I think I'm gonna get this thing right. Yeah, I put it on easily last night. Yeah, somebody with two hands. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Um, I need to switch over here. All right. Lassen Peak is located in the northeastern part of California. And it's the most prominent feature in Lassen Volcanic National Park. Uh, Lassen Peak last, uh, erupted in 1915, but it's still considered an active volcano. It's the southernmost active volcano in the Cascade Range, which includes Mount Shasta, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, a bunch of other ones. Um, 
And the, uh, you, know, the, you know it's active because there's all kinds of volcanic activity in the area. There's all kinds of geothermal activity, lots of interesting places to go there. Um, these are the red spots on the map are uh, all areas that are either hot springs or steam vents or bubbling mud pots and uh, you know just an interesting place to go. One place I want to point out before we go too far in the story is this area here called Broke Off Mountain. It's not Breakback Mountain. <laughs> just to be clear. The story has nothing to do with that. But there's a really interesting, probably the most interesting feature is an area uh, called Rumpus Hell, uh, which is an area named after a, uh, an explorer, an early settler there, who was unfortunate enough to have that name. And uh, <laughs> it was also unfortunate enough that one of the stories told that he was guiding some people through the area and warning them to be careful where they stepped. And as he said that, he put his foot through the crust and burned his leg very badly and ended up naming that area after him. Well, um, when I was in optometry school, I was not that far from there, down in the Bay Area uh, in Berkeley. And one Christmas vacation, um, I think in 1975, could have been 76, a classmate of mine and I decided that we would go for a little ski touring, backpacking up in the park, because they get a lot of snow in there. Get up to 30 feet of snow in high elevation. <coughs> so we, we drove up the valley of Cal uh, the California Valley here to get up to that spot. You see the red spot is where the park is. And I'm kind of disappointed because there wasn't a lot of snow or precipitation. And we were a little worried we might be walking instead of skiing. But um, when we got to the, well, as we were driving up, just as a distraction, I think it may have been because I'm not sure if I remember this right, but I'm thinking the radio in the car didn't work. And I started reading out loud some of the stuff that we had in the guidebook for the park. And one of the things was the thing about um, avalanches and what you do if you're in an avalanche. And I read, I read this out loud in the car, and it said, you know, if you think you're caught in an avalanche, when you think it's stopping, when you think you're coming, because you're going to get knocked over, you put one hand, and remember, you may meet this someday, um, <laughs> put one hand up to your mouth, and then reach the other, if you know what's up, reach that hand up as high as you can, because maybe you'll punch through the snow, and people can find you. We didn't think much of that. Um, and, if you, and if those of you in the audience that know the rest of this story, please just keep them on. But the, uh, so we came into the park around here. This is the visitor center. And the, the ranger there told us uh, that there wasn't going to be any precipitation for two or three days, which was disappointing to us. And there was a little snow. The road that goes up through the park is closed in the winter because they get so much snow. But, and this time it was closed, so that's great for, for us that want to go ski or hike up there. Um, but we set, headed up that road the next morning after just spending the night in the campground there. Um, and we skied up the road, and the snow was so slight that you could ski on it, but you couldn't even get your ski poles to go. They were hitting pavement when you, when you dug your ski poles in. And so we clicked and clacked up the, up the road and got up to the, the, the up here you can see it. Oh, you can see it first. <coughs> Um, yep. You can see where Bumpus Hell is here, and the parking lot up there, um, there's a hiking trail, and so about, a, it's about five miles to drive or ski up to that spot, and then about a mile and a half from the trailhead into Bumpus Hell. And as we did that, it started to snow a little bit, despite we being told that there wouldn't be any snow for several days. By the time we got up there, it was snowing pretty good, and we thought that was okay, you know, it was going to be good conditions. So we pitched our tent, spent the night, we woken up a couple of times in the middle of the night because there was so much snow that it was actually collapsing the tent on us. And when we got up in the morning, we were astounded. There were, had been several feet of snow had fallen. Uh, the trail, which had been very easy to follow coming out there, was gone. I mean, you, we, you could find signposts, but the, the actual boardwalk that is the trail over all this stuff was gone. And uh, we, uh, I think we probably panicked a little bit. Uh, <laughs> And thought so uh, we should get, as I said, get the bumpus hell out of here. <laughs> so we started that we skied out from the, from the, that area uh, back to the road and thought, okay, we're on the road, we're safe. We didn't have this map. Uh, this map is an avalanche map, and the red zones are places where uh, where there are higher risk, actually very high risk of avalanche in the winter. So we started skiing down this road, 
And the snow was deep, and I don't know if anybody's ever done this kind of skiing, but you know, we're on heavy cross-country skis, and one guy goes in front because he's got to break the trail, um, and you take turns doing that because it's hard going, and it's much easier to be the second guy. Well, it was my turn to go first, and uh, we got to a point, one of those red stones along there, where I literally felt the earth move under my feet. Um, it was then like, it really it was like being hit by a 20 foot wave. Snow knocked me on my side. And what did I do? Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, got enough snow away from my face that I could, you know, I could breathe. But this is California. This is not Utah snow. This, is, this stuff is like concrete. And I, was, and I had a heavy pack in my back, which maybe there's some fortune in this that I had all the food. Um, <laughs> I had a heavy back, pack on, I had skis clamped to my, to my, to my boots, and I, I really couldn't move. I mean, I really thought, well, this is uh, going to be an empty seat in my hall um, <laughs> come, come January. And uh, the, really the most incredible experience, uh, sensation, with that hand that was up, I, after a while, of course, no idea how much how long it was, I felt something grab that hand. And then there was a digging sound around it, which my first thought was, this is kind of some kind of animal. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was, of course, it was a human being. Um, and, you know, to make a long story short, because this probably took hours, um, he dug me out of that, you know, really hard packed snow in the process, trying to dig with his bare hands, broke one of his skis. So now, here we are. He eventually got me out, it took a long, long time. Got me out, we couldn't get my skis out. They were down where my feet were, so it was part of this thing down. And uh, we thought, well, we could try to walk out. Well, it, it was waist deep snow, and, there's no, and wet, heavy snow, so there's no way you're doing that. You're gonna die if you try to do that. So we decided to camp. And uh, right there on the road, and we just wait till somebody showed up. But fortunately, we had food and everything, and we had warm sleeping bags. We had all everything except the skis that would make us mobile. And then we sat it out, and sometime later the next day, another group of guys came by and hello to us, and and, and they were on their way down, and they said, well, we'll tell the ranger. And it, probably, it was get dark already, so we knew it wouldn't be that night. But we spent the second night, and the next morning we woke up to the sound of the snow cap, and the ranger came up and took us down the hill, uh, back to our car, and went on with life. And I'm kind of telling you this story, because if, I mean, if that story turned out differently, I mean, I didn't even know when I was laying in the snow whether he was in the same situation I was or not. He could well have been in the same situation. Unfortunately not. And, uh, well, if this had turned out differently, I wouldn't be here, and a lot of this stuff wouldn't have happened. So, <laughs> I've, I've entitled this talk Optometry in Three Dimensions because, I, as Carla mentioned and some of you know, I've, I've had these three different careers within optometry. I've practiced for over 20 years. Um, I taught for a half dozen years at Pacific University and then I finished my career in industry. And I, and I think it does give you some different dimensions on, on uh, different facets of optometry. Now I've also subtitled it The Rise and Fall of the Contact Lens Modality. And uh, you'll see, we'll get into this in a second, but um, Modality is a term that is used incorrectly in the contact lens field a great deal of time. Modality is the manner in which you use something. There are two uses for contact lenses. Basically, daily wear and extended wear. Those are really the only two modalities that exist. You hear people say all the time, one week modality, two week modality, monthly modality, whatever. That's a misuse of the term. Those, those are replacement cycles, replacement schedules. They're not modalities. So there's a little soapbox thing that, uh, that I learned from our regulatory people, but I, I tried to stick to that, using that term the correct way. And the modality I'm going to talk about um, is extended wear, because it's had an interesting history that has, that I've lived really the history of extended wear, and I think it's kind of an interesting thing to look at. Um, but I started out, as you were told, in, in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin always has been, had been a blue state, <laughs> but uh, um, but I, I did my undergrad in Wisconsin and, and went to, to Berkeley for California and had some really you know some really significant influences there. Um, one of which one of our professors at the time was 
Irving Fett. This is the guy who gave us these terms of DK and DK over L. His, his early history, first half of his career, he was a guy that switched careers also. He was in, in the oil shale business, and he studied and worked on the process of getting oil to move through semi-porous rock, um, which is all, turns out to have a lot of things in common with trying to get oxygen to walk, go through a semi-permeable membrane. Um, and he did a lot of a lot of that work that you know where we learned about just the terminology to use with uh, with permeability of materials and, and, and oxygen uptake of cornea. This fellow you might you may recognize, a very younger version of, of Dr. Hill. A decade before I got there, he was he was not at Berkeley when I was there, but he had spent his earlier years at Berkeley and if you look in the history of this, there's a whole lot of publications that are Hill and Fat and Fat and Hill. They did a lot of the early work on oxygen uptake, and you probably know that from your history around here also, but I don't know if you know he had that, that particular connection. And that's, I've tried to weave in some of the connections that I had to Ohio State, and there are actually quite a few <laughs> things down here. Um, another real mentor of mine was Ken Pulse. He's continued to be a friend for you know, to this day. Uh, Ken Pulse and Bob Mandel did the early work that determine what was the minimum amount of oxygen you needed at the surface of the cornea to prevent corneal hypoxia, as measured by corneal swelling. So they looked for, you know, what was the least amount of oxygen you had to have at the surface of the cornea. And that, that's, that's one of the things that's, you know, going to be used to tell us what you need in a contact lens material. In other words, how much oxygen do you have to get through it uh, in order to make the cornea breathe. Uh, Barry Weissman, uh, was a graduate student at the time and uh, got to know Barry pretty well and got to know better uh, a bit later. Um, and he turned out to be quite prophetic uh, in the whole contact lens extended wear area. And I'll, I'll bring, come back to that in a little bit. Um, these guys, uh, Brian Holden and George Mertz, well known in the contact lens field for the Holden Mertz criteria, which they initially determine what was the minimum DK over L using, uh, using VETS formula to get the amount of oxygen at the surface of the cornea that Pulse and Mandel figured you needed to have to avoid corneal swelling. Um, Brian, I worked with for years, particularly once my days when I got to see the vision, uh, we, they, his group in Australia was, was really one of our principal research groups that, that we utilized as an external group. Uh, George Merce was a, a, a topic, and Brian was at Berkeley when we were there uh, as a postdoc. Uh, George was a uh, fourth year student when we were first or second year students, and I got to know him a little bit then. Uh, got to know him a whole lot better later because we were on the AOF board together. Uh, he was president of the AOF and, and then passed away, unfortunately, and uh, I took over the reins following George. So uh, I got to know George very well. And the guy who sometimes gets, often gets forgotten this, is John McNally, who I'd like to mention, because John's a good friend, and he, uh, he's now at Cooper Vision, but he spent a long time to see the vision. But he was really the guy that did the, the work <laughs> that they were looking to figure out. Um, he, was the, he was the guy in the lab that measured the cardinal strong and said that they got with the, with the lenses. Um, and uh, so he's really the third. It's really Holden Mertz and McNally. I'd like to give him that shout out credit. Well, I graduated from Berkeley and went immediately back to Wisconsin uh, and practiced there. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to Madison, but it's, a, it's kind of an interesting city. It's, it has some things in common with Columbus. Uh, you don't have the Statue of Liberty, but um, we did for a little while when a, a student council president at the university uh, got elected by promising he would bring the Statue of Liberty to Madison. And they, they did it in this particular manner one winter. Uh, <laughs> And of course we have the university. The other thing we have that you have here also uh, is the Capitol. Um, it's the skyline of Madison in, in, in better weather. Um, and it's, it's a real pretty place. Having the Capitol there uh, exposes you to stuff, if you want, uh, that having to do with all the legislative stuff. And at the time, we we're talking late 70s, this was a hot time for legislation and optometry. Maybe half the states we're not even allowed to use diagnostic pharmaceuticals. And really, we, you know, I graduated and went to a state where I couldn't even use fluoresce uh, or, 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 or dry so, 
Uh, but at the time the law had been passed, they had not established the actual final rules. And I got immediately involved with um, testifying on the, you know, what I had learned in school, because they are as inter interested in what's taught in schools with regard to that. And frankly, I could answer some questions that nobody else in the end, in room could answer. Like the, the, the head of the examining board uh, was a pharmacist, and she said, well, what's the, uh, what's, what's the preservative in Flores? Because of course, ophthalmology was saying we were going to poison all these people with pseudomonas infections. And I said, well, it's an oxidate. I happen to know that. Uh, or no, chlorobutanol. And it's the right answer. But at any rate, I knew it more quickly then. Uh, <laughs> so that was kind of useful. And then uh, they passed a rule that required optometrists who using pharma uh, diagnostic pharmaceuticals to report on it every six months. You had to fill out a card, how many anesthetics you use, how many dilating drops you use, and what were the benefits, good and what were the pluses and minuses, how many referrals did you make, how many things you diagnosed, how many adverse events did you have. And it went for a couple of years, and nothing ever happened with that stuff. And I called up the state board and I said, what are you doing with that stuff? They said, nothing. And uh, I said, would you mind if I came and took a look at it? And I went down to the state board, it was all just right there in Madison, very handy, and tabulated the stuff all up, and uh, published a little article in uh, the prestigious journal of Wisconsin Optometrics. <laughs> Well, this actually got picked out notice at the AOA and ended up that a bunch of states used this in passing their uh, their diagnostic. Because the, the results were obviously very good. I mean, they were, they were good in that there were hardly any adverse events. There were a lot of people being referred. It was bad and that optometrists weren't dilating hardly anybody at that point. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, ophthalmology was saying that we were going crazy with this stuff and we were going to poison people and, you know, people were going to have atropine poisoning. And, the, you know, so it, it debunked a, a lot of that. So it was actually pretty useful information. It was really one of my early forays into getting involved uh, with organized optometry. Now, there, just a little aside on this. Um, sometime around this time, the guy who was the optometry state board uh, called me up and asked if I would help with the practical exam. And he, I said, well, yeah, OK. And I'm only a couple years out of school. And he said, well, we decided that we should have the slip lamp on the exam. And frankly, there's nobody on the board that knows enough to ask any questions about it. <laughs> so you see how optometry's changed. <laughs> this time. About the same time, 1979, uh, we had the introduction of the Perma lens, which was the first extended wear contact lens uh, approval in the US and was approved only for AFAC extended wear. You know, how much use would you have for that today? Probably not much. Um, but we had a lot of use for it then. I mean, AFIGs were really, really a problem in practice then. Because uh, they did cataract surgery and that was it. There were no IOLs. Um, or they were definitely in their infancy and considered risky. You know, the American Academy of Ophthalmology opposed IOLs for a long time. Um, so we would get these patients in and I managed to build up a little reputation because I was willing to see these patients. And uh, like I said, you need about a dozen of these patients in your practice and you're full because they take a lot of time. And, but the other thing that was going on about the same time was this business about radiokeratotomy. They were having ophthalmologists go to the, the then USSR and learn radiokeratotomy. Um, and the FDA was not crazy about that, and it was something they had to control. It's not a device, it's not a drug. Um, they can't really control this kind of a procedure. And I think that they were kind of aware that that was going to be an issue. Um, somebody that was pretty smart. Uh, but one of the solutions to that was to go ahead and approve extend wear for myopes and hyperopes and just uh, you know general vision use. Barry Weissman, who I mentioned earlier, was and had finished graduate school and he had taken a position in directing contact lens services at UCLA um, in the Jules Stein Eye Institute, where he saw a lot of patients with complications. I mean that's kind of what a clinic like that sees, and he was seeing really a number of problems with extended wear. And he published this in very early part of 1983, uh, where basically says the concept is the culprit. And this doesn't, this is, uh, this is not uh, a good idea to have people sleep in contact lenses. And I think most of us think he was right at the time. But in contrast, Contact Lens Forum predicted that extended wear would be 50% of the contact lens market in a few years. Um, that never happened. Uh, for a number of reasons, but you know, part of it had to do with uh, 
with people like Barry getting on a soapbox. And I, I actually had him out to Wisconsin to give a continuing education lecture of, about this time. And he made a very strong statement that people should not be sleeping with contact lenses. And in the middle of the lecture, the entire lecture hall stood up and applauded him. The optometrists did not want this pushed on them. And the contact lens companies really one of extended wear contact lenses are one of the first items that were promoted directly to the consumer. Well, watch TV for 15 minutes these days, and you'll see all kinds of prescription stuff promoted directly to consumers. But that started really with extended wear lenses. Um, a big milestone in my life, and something just speaking to the younger crowd here, uh, get involved with the academy. Um, it would be one of the, the greatest professional uh, forums you will find. You'll, you'll, you'll be surrounded by smart people. Um, and I, I've gone to a continuing education lecture from, a, from an old contact lens specialist. And when he gave a list of about 10 things you should do if you wanted to be a contact lens specialist like him, and he said one of them was become a diplomat in the section of the cornea contact lenses. And I took that to heart and went to work and, and, and did that. And it, it's turned out to be really one of the best things I did. Um, I made some of my best you know, colleagues and friends in, 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 in optometry there. This is a group of uh, past chairs. They recognize a few faces in there, I hope, uh, if not most of them. Um, but lo and behold, after, not that long after I had gotten that diplomate and was feeling pretty smart, um, we had this picture appear on the front page of our local newspaper. It was part of a series of articles uh, talking about extended wear contact lenses. Now, fortunately, most people who just got the newspaper didn't recognize that that was a human eye. Um, but that is, that's, a, that's a young girl from Wisconsin who got a corneal ulcer wearing uh, extended wear contact lenses. And the reason it looks like that is they put a conjunctival flap over it because it wouldn't heal otherwise. That's what they do. They do a lot in, in veterinary, but they, have, they do it in desperate cases in ophthalmology where the topical medication, which of course we're talking 1980s, weren't as good as we have now. Um, and this way you can get, bring a vascular supply to it, hopefully cure them, not lose the eye. And then eventually this is taken off and they, they do a, 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 a keratoplasty. Um, but, you know, not, not, a, not a great way to live. Um, but then there were other articles. There were a whole series of articles um, published as a series that was actually won some awards. The, the author was a was a local guy that I knew. He and his wife were both patients in the practice. Um, and you can see how this kind of cascades into uh, uh, kinds of things to get people's attention, including getting to the point where the state board wanted to ban extended wear altogether, even though it was an FDA approved thing. Um, a little bit after that time, uh, the landmark study done by Oliver Stein, who was kind of the premier ophthalmic epidemiologist at the time, uh, that showed that wearing extended wear contact lenses increased the risk of microbial keratitis by 10 to 15 times compared to uh, daily wear contact lenses. Well, that was a big deal and shut up a lot of people who were promoting extended wear for a while. Uh, but then along came these, and I'm sorry for the not so great picture, but it was, I want to show a picture of the really original, original packaging of the AccuV lens. You know, the AccuV lens was initially, uh, its, its approval was for, was for extended wear. Um, the reason they got to call it disposable was it was designed for single use. We use the term disposable much more broadly now, but it was designed for single use, put it in where for a week and throw it away. And many people thought this was going to be the salvation because we were going to we were going to virtually eliminate bacterial contamination and the possibility of uh, that extended wear could go on and be really successful uh, was great. Well, oh, a year or so after that, uh, Shine's group published another article where they'd done a case control series uh, of people with microbial keratitis and found that the risk of microbial keratitis with disposable lenses was nearly double what we were getting with conventional hydrogel contact lenses. Who knows why? I don't think that there's necessarily any logic in that, other than that sometimes when something new like that comes out, practitioners have a tendency to use it in patients who are at risk because they think that it's going to be safer for them, and so there's kind of a selection bias thing that goes on there. But at any rate, uh, it clearly wasn't the solution to the extended wear problem. And at the same time, 
perversely the same time, we had the introduction of multi-purpose solutions. Some of you will remember or know just from reading history that at one time, contact lens wearers had all kinds of solutions they used. They had cleaning solutions, such as a saline solution, you know, enzyme cleaners. Um, and they boiled the lenses, and they had to do all this rigmarole. A, you know, a, a, a multi-purpose solution, that you just have one bottle, really simplified contact lens care. Um, and myself, probably others at the same time thought about this, that you know, if you use, took these disposable lenses and used them with these products on a daily wear basis, you have something that would be really convenient and, uh, and safe relatively safe, safer than extended wear. And I wrote this little article uh, using daily, promoting the idea of using daily disposable lenses for, uh, using disposable lenses for daily wear. And this, at this point, that was an off-label use, as odd as that seems, but because they were really an extended wear contact lens. Um, the editor of the contact lens factor at the time was this guy. <laughs> I knew Joe well at the time. And, um, but then, you know, this was, you know, um, well, when was it? So the, this was around, around that same time, early 90s. And just to look at this, you can see along the bottom what happened with extended wear contact lenses from 1989 to 98. No growth in the absolute number, and actually a reduction in the percentage of the market that they were because contact lenses were growing all the time while extended wear was doing nothing. And people thought, well, extended wear is kind of dead and gone. And unless we come up with a better solution, uh, it's, it's not viable. Well, then this, this happened. <laughs> Silicon hydrogel lenses came into play. Uh, Des Vaughn um, is also a good colleague that I worked with a lot. Um, presented data that they had from up at University of Waterloo that showed that the amount of swelling you got Again, the kind of swelling being the indicator for hypoxia um, was no more, when you wore these lenses, was no more than you got with just a closed eye with no contact lens on. So, okay, now we've got a contact lens that's essentially transparent to oxygen. You're getting all the minimum oxygen requirements to the surface of the cornea, no corneal swelling, um, that's no significance at all uh, with the contact lens. And shortly after that, we had the launch of the night and day lens. Um, Seeing here a little promotional piece from Mexico because that's where it was first launched. Um, but this was the original the Focus Night and Day. So this is around 2000. Um, some friends that I had made through Academy activities, Linda Castor, Pat Caroline, Jenny Smythe, uh, real good friends uh, out at Pacific University. And uh, they had an opening for a director of contact lens services. And coincidentally, I was at this 22, 23 year mark where I had said when I started that I was probably going to practice about 20 years and do something else. And this seemed like the something else and move out there and work with friends and have a good time um, was, uh, was appealing to me. So I, I sold my practice and picked up and left. Um, and uh, went from Wisconsin out to Oregon. I can't ignore because Forest Grove is, but it's actually west of Portland. It's kind of between Portland and the coast. Um, it's an uh, interesting little town, and uh, it looks about like this, except the roads are changed now. <laughs> but here's Pacific University, and I'm a little more prideful here. Um, and had great experience there, and one of the things that I really enjoyed about, I mean, I enjoyed teaching, I enjoyed working with students, but I was interested in doing, uh, doing, starting to do some little clinical research, and knew we couldn't do anything really big, but we knew we could do a lot of little stuff. Um, and we had a lot of support from Linda Kasser, who was the, um, the uh, uh, academic dean at the time. She got us some space and, and uh, got us some room in our schedules. And we started a little research group. And we were productive. I mean, we had, uh, we had abstract after abstract after abstract at, uh, uh, at the academy when Pacific had really been pretty invisible at the academy. They had very little there. And we started having lots of stuff and getting students and residents involved in, and people were pretty enthusiastic about it. Um, and we were building a little bit of reputation for ourselves. And along in that reputation, um, and some pe other people that I knew from Academy, here's another Ohio person, many of you recognize Sally Dillahay, uh, along with Bill Wong. These guys were at Vision, and they were promoting the Night Dead Lens. 
And one of the things I wanted to do was show that wearing silicon hydrogel lenses, even on an extended wear basis, cause fewer eye problems than wearing daily wear of regular hydrogels. Even. And at the time, the mainstream thing that was being done was, not necessarily because of me, but exactly what I recommended in that article, use the lenses for two weeks and replace them, but use them with a multi-purpose solution and, and don't sleep out. So we were asked to join in a big, rather large study, which involved people at Ohio State and a number of other locations, where we, we studied for, for three years a group of people who were wearing 39 extended wear, they were all wearing 39s, and a group of people were wearing two-week daily disposable lenses. Um, and we followed them over a period of three years. And we ended up, again, with a whole raft of publications and, and things that we, that we had, presentations. Um, and sooner or later, I don't know if that's exactly how things happened, but I got a phone call one day uh, from Bill Wong saying, gee, we have an opening here for uh, Director of Clinical Research, and uh, we'd like you to come out and take a look and interview and such. And I don't know, just depending on what the circumstances were, but I, uh, uh, well, we, uh, we picked up and moved um, they, from, from Oregon to Atlanta, of all places, to join CEBA Vision. Uh, and after that, there were a number, of, these were all, all papers that came out, these are all from the three-year study, so it was really a pretty productive study. Um, Culminating really in this one, and I, I don't know, I just had somewhat luck of the draw. I got to be the, the, the lead author on this one, but um, we came to a conclusion that wearing high DK silicone and hydrogel lenses minimize many ocular changes associated with soft contact lens wear. Notice it doesn't say anything about sleeping with them. <laughs> I mean, this is true with daily wear lenses as well as with extended wear lenses. And I don't think we even, that, I don't think they even dawned us at the time. And it's certainly what everybody in practice thinks now. That's why silicon hydrogels are, you know, so widely used in, in practice. So, and shortly after that, uh, Oliver Schein, again, uh, basically repeated some of their work. But this time they came out, and it was kind of interesting because they couched this differently. And that's to say, I think some of that has to do with the fact that the study was sponsored by Vision. But <laughs> they said that those are relatively low rate. Matter of fact, it's no higher than it is with extended wear of regular hydrogel lenses. Well, still, that's still going to be 10 to 15 times higher than, than, than for a daily wear lens. So there's, uh, you know, it didn't really uh, vindicate the lenses, but uh, that was used a lot in the promotion of the lenses. And notice the second author here, the name we've mentioned before, John McNally, I mentioned John before we were, uh, here we were at BCLA uh, in Liverpool. Um, kind of a fun little side uh, trip. But the uh, uh, the nine day lens was still around and it evolved into this uh, air optics night and day aqua lens as they called it. Um, and the, di the difference between this and the original product was somebody in their great wisdom thought that it should have a visibility tint. We're talking about a lens that you only handle once every 30 days. And then it needed, <laughs> and then it needed an inversion marking on it, which again Nobody was asking for that. If you ever handle these lenses, or some of the easiest lenses on earth that's all through inside out or not. And it turned out that even though we had done all kinds of clinical work with it, when they finally got to putting it out in production, somebody in the tool room decided to <laughs> improve on that inversion mark, and they made it worse. And we had a lot of problems with GPC and just uncomfortable patients. Uh, but we picked up on it real quick. We pulled it back before it had to be recalled. And, uh, but it put a black eye, so to speak, on, on the product. And then it was relaunched, and it's still in now. They've, they've taken the version mark all the way off and <laughs> left visibility tint, which is doing no harm. And, and it's still a, uh, a fairly widely used lens. Um, the next move was uh, when, when uh, Alcon, uh, well, the way it worked is Novartis, which owns Siva Vision, acquired Alcon, and then Alcon and uh, and Siva Vision were put together uh, like stepchildren. And uh, <laughs> I forgot to mention, when we moved to Georgia, it's the first time my wife or I, I had ever lived in a, in a red state. We always left the blue state. Um, we're back up in the blue. So uh, now coming in Fort Worth, and many of you, been, some of you been there, but, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I would think quite a few. And 
students and such take advantage of they'll, they'll fly you down there and give you a tour and everything. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting, but it is Texas. But at the same time, <laughs> I, I wouldn't stay with them. <laughs> but this is what happened in, essentially over the 2000s. It started out when they were first introduced silicon hydrogen lenses were used principally for extended wear. And then there was a crossover after a number of years where the extended wear went down, 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 and the uh, daily wear use of the silicon hydrogen lenses was, and now we even have daily, as you know, daily disposable silicon hydrogen lenses, which don't even have an approval for overnight wear. Um, that nobody bothers. It's a lot more difficult to get FDA approval overnight wear than it is to get data. I mean, really a lot. Uh, it takes a lot longer. And uh, and frankly, nobody wants, to, I won't say nobody wants to fit them. Um, currently, and I, I got this from the guy who's the kind of product manager for the 90 day lens now, that about 2% of new fits overall in the US go into extended wear. That's, that's all. It's, you know, not the 50% that have been predicted at one time. Um, but the night and day lens is still at about, is about 9% of the market of um, you know, non-daily disposable spherical lenses. Um, so it's, you know, it's not a small item. And they, they know at Alcon uh, that most of those lenses are used for extended wear. So there's a certain amount that are being, still being used for people who continue to continue wear. Because people who do well in it do really well in it. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't go away altogether. So from, uh, from Texas, we, uh, I, this was mentioned before, I retired, and we moved up, and we're up in Spokane, Washington, which is about there. Um, and I mentioned, I want to just show you this little picture, it's kind of cute. This, my father was an optometrist, this picture is probably taken in about 1960 or so, and if you, you notice in this room that the only piece of equipment that was in the Sharon stand is the Ferrari. Um, and I don't know if, did you, if you saw this cartoon in the paper, you know, <laughs> um, the Frogner's still there, that's, isn't that problem? Um, so, so we really, things really, really have changed. So here's where we are now. Um, we're up in uh, Washington, and uh, there's the address. I just, just Carl met for this, I just wanted you to see. That actually wasn't kidding. That's that's an authentic uh, mailing label. <laughs> and uh, just a couple pictures. These pictures are actually off of our back deck. And this is in Spokane, Missouri. And you can see what we went in there. Um, it's really spectacular. Yeah. And we, you know, people people ask, well, where? Is, everybody knows where Seattle is. I said, well, we are. We actually live. East of Spokane, we are really close to the Idaho border. As a matter of fact, we live so close that you can ride your bike to the Idaho border. And a recent visitor there <laughs> made it over the state line. And uh, you know, uh, Tom's a guy of many talents, and uh, and one of them was uh, digging people out of snowbanks. He's the guy that saved my hide uh, four years ago. <laughs> And of course, we've been good friends ever since. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of choice. Yeah. No, actually, we were on a, I still remember this very distinctly. On a Thursday night, uh, and we were studying for Tony Adams' physiological optics test, um, all this stuff about the Stiles Crawford effect and things. And uh, my phone rang, and uh, it was Tom on the phone, and he's, he, he uh, you know, I'm studying, and he said, well, um, he knew I played the guitar. He said, now, do you think you could play Sweet Georgia Brown on the guitar? And I said, well, I don't now, but I, I probably could learn it. I think I've got music for it and such. And I said, why would you ask that? And he, he said, well, I just thought, you know, tomorrow night I am doing a, I'm performing at a um, talent show at the co-op that I'm living at here in Berkeley. And I'm actually the former Palo Alto, California yo-yo champion. And I thought it would be kind of, you know, the Sweet George Brown is the theme song of the Harlem Globetrotters, and that this would be a clever thing to do. So um, the next day, I went and took that test. And sure enough, I looked, like the last question on the test was, tell us everything you know about the Stiles Crawford effect. And I thought, well, this won't take long. <laughs> 
<laughs> Gus and I had spent the entire rest of the evening learning to play sweet George. <laughs> and I, you know, and I once said, you know, to this day, I can still play sweet George on the guitar. And I've had very little use for the stuff. So <laughs> no offense to anybody who teaches. So. But I thought I would finish with just a little, uh, just a few bars of that, because I brought the guitar. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now I am nervous. <laughs> and by the way, I found this. Thing. Oh. <laughs> After more than 50 years in retirement. <laughs> So don't you want to get up? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Play with that, yeah! Which hand is it going? Yeah, yeah, you ready? String theory. didn't quite do it. <laughs> and those of you who are, some of you at your first Myers lecture or your 11th Myers lecture, you'll never miss one because you never know what's going to happen. Um, Jeff and Joyce, thank you again for sponsoring this. Peter, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming and being an enthusiastic audience. Drink a big area or whatever you're doing.